this is the kind of uh, music, bloody revolutionary song, propaganda song, I was forced to play. It's not that my favorite, it's fast, and its lyric describe killing blood and trying to brainwash children like myself to love the Anka, to love Pol Pot, who is the leader of this fanatic communist Khmer Rouge, who took over my country in 1975. I was just a child. I was 12 years old. We didn't know when they came and took over Cambodia, they forced everybody out of the city. I was taken by them from my family and forced to live with about 700 children in a, a temple, a Buddhist temple, where they converted into a, a killing place. I was forced to watch a lot of killings, a lot of thousands of people were killed, especially children. I was forced to also do, do many things, bad things, that I didn't want to do. But I had to do it, because the Khmer Rouge will kill you. In the middle of this killing, it's hell beyond words for me. Sometimes the Khmer Rouge play game with the dead. They would prop a person up and put a cigarette on their mouth and they laughed at them. I watched my own sister starve to death, slowly. They kill anyone who uh, educated, who pro the, they say pro the West, pro the Americans and the West. In the middle of this killing, I'm not sure why, uh, they brought an old man, his name, Mac, who later, later become my uh, music master teacher. And he, they said they want to form a music group. So I made a very instant life and death, death decision. I raised my hand very high in the hope that they didn't trick us. They usually trick us, but this time they didn't trick us. And they killed, four, they killed those three boys because they didn't learn fast enough. And Mike and I became a, a very close because the Khmer Rouge wanted to kill me also because I look white, whiter than them. They think I'm from middle class family and pro-Americans. And Mike told them not to kill me because I am smarter than any other kids. And sometimes they want to kill Master Mike when I play for them and I ask them not to kill Master Mike because we are helping each other to survive. I thought my life couldn't be worse, but in 1979, when the Vietnamese took over Cambodia, like thousands of other children, from probably eight, nine to 15, from the temples, and that two years I, live, I lived at that temple, there were only 60 kids left. And I was one of the lucky one. And they took my flute away, they took my instruments away, they gave me guns, and they struck us out, they forced us out into the uh, front line to f fight against the Vietnamese. We didn't even know how to use the guns. We were forced into, like thousands of other kids, were forced into a front line to get shot first and die first, and many of them became my friend. They got shot left and right from me, and I could not help them. And I don't know, I ran away, I could not take it seeing those kids killed. I decided to run away into the jungle by myself, following monkeys for food to eat, and eventually, I don't know how many months, I reached Thailand, a refugee camp in Thailand, where I met my foster, met uh, Peter Pan. 
they call him American. He, he, later, he became my foster father. In 1980, I don't know how he did this, so he took me to America, and I was, I thought I, my life was better. But the next day, he took me to, to high school in New Hampshire, and it was my first uh, plane ride. It was my first, I asked for rice, he got mad. I, I, he took me to something I eat called hamburgers. I threw it all up. I didn't know how to eat it. And I get angry at him because there's no rice. And it's already the next morning, he took me to high school, this high school. And I never, in my life, never seen so many white kids. Uh, coming out of classroom, and I already felt tr trouble. They're making fun of me, they didn't know. It's all the white kids. They never seen a white Asian before, I think. And I was outnumbered. I've never felt so lonely in my life, even in the jungle of Cambodia. I mean, sitting a cla in the classroom, we, it's like a wall between us, all of us. I was hurt inside because I heard the word monkey, they call me monkey. And they, they said, go back where you belong. You don't belong here. And I, I, I was hurt and I had fight, I ran away from home and it seems like I was sitting near by them, near them, but it's like a wall of, it's like a thousand miles. I'm, I've never felt so lonely and angry. It seems like they don't understand where I came from, and my dad knew that I was, I wanted to kill myself, I wanted to buy a gun. My dad knew that I, I I'm, he, he came to me, he said, you, you better speak about your life, because these young people need to know where you came from. You can survive the jungle of Cambodia, you might not survive the jungle of New Hampshire. I thought he was serious about it. I didn't speak English at all. That's one other reason why I can't. When I had a fight with, that, with the American kids, I ended up in detention because I can't, I can't communicate to them. I thought nobody was in my side. So if I, I took it. I, I thought that American kid would not listen, would not want to hear what I came, where I came from, where Cambodia is. They, they are so busy going to the mall and go dancing or whatever, they're so busy, uh, and, and some of them very spoiled. I don't think they care. But I, I was wrong. I, I told my, I, and I eventually I spoke a few words about my life. And for the very first time, I play m music again. And I never thought in my life that just playing music. I saw some of them cry. I'm not sure why they cry, but... I thought that gun was more powerful. But I never thought that just playing the flute, they, these kids cry. For me, now, they learned that where I came from, they probably didn't understand, but still now I've got support, but I still, folk, I still uh, deal with my own dream. I have a lot of nightmares. Probably they don't know that either. And I knew that one day I have to go back to face my past. It was always a scary thing for me to go back to Cambodia. But I eventually while I was in high school, I went back to Cambodia and trying to find my family in my village there. I couldn't find anyone. First, I walked the street. Then, all of a sudden, I found Master Mike. He survived all these years cutting hair and got drunk on, on the street. And I thought he was happy. I was so happy, and, you know, I go hug him. And he hugged me, and but I, he was smiling, but I saw tears coming out of his eyes I never seen before. And he said, where have you been? 
And then he said, uh, you have to find something for me to do, that otherwise I will die. And I met a woman. I heard her singing on the radio be even before Pol Pot, when I was a young boy, a little kid. I heard her squeaky voice on the radio, singing opera. And I know her by name, and I call her. And she, she was the last opera singer ever. And both of them was for the very first time to, for me to hear. I was so happy. She called me son. They called me son. So that was the birth of Cambodian living arts, to match this master with the students. The Khmer Rouge, I found out that the Khmer Rouge killed 90% of all the performers, including my f members of my family, my dad and my mom. I found out that they were own an opera company in that village. And I found out more, uh, being a Cambodian Americans, that American bombed Cambodia. There's three million tons of B-52. They carpeting Cambodia even before the Khmer Rouge. So many, many masters died. They taught their student one to one. It's oral music. They don't write music down. So it's very dangerous to have any war or a, 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 some kind of a, like a killing field. That's what Cambodian known for, known as. And now, I, now they are big organization now, Cambodia Living Arts, 15 years later, that now we have a scholarship program that I am very happy of. And we have also now a, a community uh, art where we have classes in 10 provinces, and we have um, uh, art leaders now, and we also teaching these kids how to perform, especially young girls who are now on the street, teaching them to perform this traditional art that, they, that they've, they've never seen or know before, and have a decent living. So we just give them the basic needs to, to, to not to do anything else, and then they will strive My dream was is to transform. These kids are transforming Cambodia now. And I would love to have Cambodia known of its culture and a beautiful art that I am also learning and a family that I've, a new family that I'm finding right now to transform Cambodia, not for the world and to, not, to know Cambodia, not the killing field, but, but to, of, the, of its art and this beautiful culture. And recently I just found something called the first Khmer Magic Music Bus, where I am now in the bus with those kids, and this time those kids and me, and we're bringing the Cambodian Living Art Master and Student together to a remote countryside now where they're, these kids never seen, and these villagers never heard or seen or touched any instruments in their whole life. For the very first time that I've now hearing music, and those kids hearing music in the bus and singing No More Bombs, we are carpeting Cambodia with music now, not bomb. And imagine those bombs, one bomb, can buy tens of this bus. And my dream, my first dream is that to have those young people now, every child in my country and in the world to carry musical instruments and sing about love, not carrying guns and preach hate. That's my dream for the world. And I'm going to play this last piece for you. It's more hopeful for me and for the world. It's called a lullaby, it's, it's a call a, a bumpe. Every child would wish to hear this in the world. <laughs> 